Pakistan. Um, I'm a digital rights activist. I also uh, run a non-profit organization called Digital Rights Foundation. Um, today I would like uh, to talk about um, and, uh, different uh, regulatory frameworks that are taking place even during COVID. So uh, during COVID in Pakistan, we have seen that uh, while uh, mostly people around the world moved on to the um, uh, internet and virtual spaces, in Pakistan students and uh, um, uh, many people who work uh, usually in the offices moved on to the remote uh, and virtual spaces. However, people from the uh, villages, towns and far flung areas where internet uh, wasn't available uh, were left behind. So the issue of digital divide uh, came out as a big uh, a main issue which the government was supposed to focus on but what we noticed that uh, more focus was on reg uh, initiating and introducing more regulations around controlling internet. The one that we uh, we are seeing uh, right now is uh, with the name of uh, online harms rules uh, uh, which basically uh, regulate uh, more um, uh, content around internet and pose threat uh, to the activists, journalists, human rights defenders around their uh, freedom uh, on um, uh, freedom uh, to free speech and expression. Um, and another thing that I would really like to focus on is the lack of uh, understanding the digital security uh, within the human rights defenders um, 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 community but at the same time how uh, different powerful actors are focusing uh, on uh, um, um, importing and exporting surveillance technology and that technology is being used to uh, uh, surveil human rights defenders at the same time send them uh, um, a very sophisticated malware and uh, targeted malware attacks. So there is a need to focus on this issue, not just uh, the security, the digital security of the human rights defenders, uh, uh, at the, uh, but at the same time, the larger issue of digital rights uh, that should be the focus of uh, uh, UNSR uh, as well. Thank you for this uh, opportunity to share some thoughts. Uh, cities uh, have played an important role in offering support to human rights defenders at risk, particularly by offering temporary relocation in a meaningful way. Uh, I think the city of Oslo uh, can also build on that, They're trying to learn and go beyond what uh, other cities have been able to offer. At a national level, I think uh, foreign governments like Norway have played a very important role. I have interacted with the, the Norwegian ambassador and the staff uh, in the embassy in Colombo for a number of years. Uh, I think that interaction has always been very positive and there have been occasions where Norway has helped uh, uh, very practically in terms of uh, support to human rights defenders, uh, offering funding, offering uh, visa on one occasion, a long term visa to a human rights defender at risk. In that case actually that human rights defender ended up never using that visa and he's still here. Uh, but it was very important at that time that that visa was issued. And then there has also been the, the more political support of taking up cases uh, with the governments uh, in particular situation that human rights defenders face. So I think that kind of situation has to continue. Uh, one obstacle I think is the lack of human resources uh, in the different embassies. That greatly restricts the, I think, the amount of support that can be extended to human rights defenders. Uh, the UN has always played a very important role in protection and support to human rights defenders, particularly the mandate of the Special Rapporteur. Uh, and I think uh, with Mary, uh, I think that can continue and go beyond what it was in the previous times. Uh, uh, particular challenge that I want to flag now is that uh, sometimes there is, I think, less follow-up done by UN uh, special procedures, again, because of lack of human resources. So I think some efforts to get more human resources to support the mandate would be important. Again, Norway has played an important role for many years in that. And I think that has to go on and that has to expand. Uh, another challenge that we have faced uh, uh, in terms of uh, working with the UN and getting support is that uh, communications and urgent appeals that we send to the UN, we don't know the results of that, uh, whether the UN has acted on it or not, or what has been the response of the government for many months. So if there can be a way to work around that to inform the complainants and those affected, I think that would be a great thing. Hello. My name is Alexandra Jimenez and I would like to thank this invitation to share on the situation of human rights defenders. I am the country consultant for the Norwegian Human Rights Fund in Mexico and in that role I support our partners and access a link between the office in Oslo and our partners in the country. 
Most of our partners are human rights defenders in the first line. They are environmental defenders. They are indigenous peoples fighting to defend and preserve their ancestral land and cosmovision. They are women defending women's rights and increasing their participation. During this time of pandemic, most of them have been supporting their communities, addressing their rights to food and health, facing enormous structural challenges in the access to rights and justice. Some of them are also facing serious risks for their lives, for their communities and their families. Mexico was already amongst the most dangerous places for being a human rights defender or a journalist. However, the pandemic has exacerbated the risk and inequalities for them. The restrictions have limited their action and affected their vulnerability. The most affected have been the land and environmental defenders, women defenders who are exposed to experimental double risk and people who is, who is defending the civil space. More than ever, we need the international community to permanently monitor the situation of human rights defenders and keep encouraging to adopt and, and implement effective laws and mechanisms to protect defenders, to make public calls on specific situations that affect their work and life. I'm going to mention six specific key issues for the states and the international community. First one, to ensure that governments, companies and other non-state actors recognize communities and human rights defenders in a broad term, including members of civil society organizations, political activists, environmental defenders and journalists. Second, to keep a focus on the most vulnerable during this pandemic, assess the specific risk and implement a gender and intersectional perspective on security. Third, to end impunity and prevent attacks against defenders by addressing and embracing their causes. Fourth, to eradicate police brutality and avoid the use of criminal action to repress rights. Defending freedom of expression, association and all civil liberty are, is crucial. Fifth, to keep the guiding principles on business and human rights and the 2030 Agenda as a compass to face the economic and social challenges. Advocate for the implementation of the Escazú Agreement in Latin America as the first treaty in the world that explicitly protect, protects the rights of environmental defenders. Sixth, all the policies designed and developed to protect defenders should involve them. Listening to them is crucial in order to achieve a more sustainable world and to build a more just post-pandemic future. As the human rights defenders do, and the 2030 Agenda promises, we need to remember, leave no one behind. Thank you.